Hey, Voices of Distilling listeners. Let's talk about a little something that's at the core of every distillery. I'm talking about yeast. Not just any yeast. I'm talking about the brand of yeast from AB Biotech, Pinnacle Distiller's Yeast. Now, you and I both know that yeast is the unsung hero of distilling. It's not just about science. They believe in being partners in fermentation. They've got expertise across the board. Whether you're all about wine, a beer enthusiast, or like us, a fanatic for distilled spirits, they're part of the story your distillery is writing, part of the community that is pushing for the best and always eager to help you reach new heights with solutions and technical services that you need. So why settle for just any yeast when you can ferment with the best? Elevate your distilling game. Make Pinnacle Distillers Yeast your partner in fermentation today. From the heart of America to the corners of the globe, welcome to Voices of Distilling, powered by the American Distilling Institute. Unearth the stories, the passion, and the faces behind every drop. Dive deep into the world where tradition meets innovation with me, your host, Ron L. Richards. Let's tap into the spirit of distilling where every voice is unique, but the heart remains the same. Let the journey begin. Welcome to Voices of Distilling, brought to you by the American Distilling Institute, the heart of distilling. I am Ron L. Richards, the Chief Marketing Officer at ADI, host of Business and Bourbon, and the host of this wonderful show that I'm so excited about, so excited to bring this to the distilling community. And today's guest, I've got Paul Chikalian coming from Joshua Tree Distillery. How are we doing, Paul? Doing great. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's good to see you, man. I mean, so so we're, we're here at the ADI 20-year anniversary conference, um, and I understand you've been to multiple conferences. Now, this is our first time in Vegas, and, uh, and, and that's just a drive for you from Joshua Tree. Not too far, right? Yeah, pretty, uh, pretty easy, convenient drive just straight through the California desert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, tell me... Because I've been, I've been itching. We had a little conversation prior to this, and I've been itching to ask you about your membership at ADI because you've been, you've been hanging with us for for a while. You were in St. Louis last year. You were in Louisville the year before that. What keeps you coming? Yeah, I mean, so three three conferences out of twenty. Uh, you know, not necessarily that many as a percentage. Back to back to back. That's a but, three but people. Yes, we have come. We have come every year uh, since starting the distillery. Um, no, it's been a great community. Really supportive. Uh, learn a lot. You know, at the conventions, useful stuff, especially as we were starting uh, the business, uh, expanding into new products or types of products, and you know, and more learnings involved in that. And so. Um, you know, it's been a good uh, resource to plug in, um, you know, vendors and the expo, the yeah. source materials, especially, again, being a newer company. Um, yeah. And then the community, you know, we're interacting on ADI forums and that kind of stuff, you know, over the course of the year. Um, so it's just been a good experience every time. So I keep coming back. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, it's, I'm, I'm really happy to see you, man. And, you know, this whole show, uh, Voices of a Distilling, it's really about providing a voice to our members like you, man, that are out there in the trenches doing the work. Share. We want you to share your best practices, share your story so we can, can kind of help the, the whole community grow and to, to learn a little something from your wisdom and your experience. All right. As we get into this. We're going to do, you know, this is our first season of this, so we're going to try some things that are that are kind of fun and a little different. Uh, today, I'm going to start with um, a little-known distilling fact. Little known to me, but maybe not to you. Maybe you already know this. Now, did you know, as I'm ruffling through my papers here, so I, I have it memorized, but the word is so hard to pronounce, like Chikalian, that um, I have to look at the paper. All right, so did you know, in China, there's a distilled spirit made from bamboo, which is called, I'm sorry to all my Chinese friends, Zui Yi King? I, I did not know that. No. You did? I yeah. did not know. Okay, all right. I would imagine that would have a lot of methanol in it. You think so? Well, it's, it's bamboo's mostly cellulose, right? Yeah. Wood? Methanol's wood alcohol? Yeah, I, that's... Uh, what do you imagine that tastes like? I have no idea because I imagine it would taste like methanol, which yeah. would be bad. Uh -huh. <laughs> unless you're um, into that. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, unless you really just hate your uh, sense of sight. Um, 
But yeah, so I mean, if you do, you know, good cuts and it's just the remaining, you know, drinkable alcohol. Yeah, probably pretty neutral, probably yeah. kind of woody. Uh, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to learn more about that. Yeah. Hey, if you're out there and you are making some bamboo spirit, send it to Paul so we can check it out. Yeah. Send me some too. Absolutely. We'll enjoy some. All right. So let's talk about your story real quick, man. I really want to get into, first of all, how, what were you doing before distilling? So I was a, a scientist. Uh, I worked at NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. Wow. Um, before that, I was... Uh, Did uh, you work with Steve Zissou? No. No? no. Okay. <laughs> um, I only worked at NOAA for, for like less than a year. Um, before that, I was a grad student doing a, a doctorate in environmental science. I studied mm. uh, climate change impacts. So not super related to distilling. But before I went into academia, I um, was... Uh, a person, a young kid in college in the Seattle area in 2010-ish and around a lot of amazing craft beer and craft coffee and mm. noticed a real uh, gap in the market with craft spirits. There were, you know, less than five brands, I think, uh, around visibly at that time. Um, so I almost started a distilling company back then. It would have been in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, I kind of left it up to fate. If I got into uh, grad school, I was going to go on my academic journey. And if I didn't, I was thinking about trying my hand at distilling. So I ended up getting to grad school. So I was in academia for, for about a decade. Mm -hmm. But um, and I loved that. It was great. Um, I loved being a grad student. All the experiences I had, the research was really important. Uh, and I'm still close friends with all my colleagues that, that I work with. But once it went from being a student to becoming a job, um, I just didn't love it as much. Mm. And so I was looking for a, a career change. I wanted to be independent um, and, you know, set my own schedule and all that kind of stuff. I come from a huge family of small business owners. I'm the only one with a college degree of any kind, mm -hmm. uh, let alone, a, you know, an advanced degree. Um, so being entrepreneurial in a lot of ways made more sense than what I had been doing the first 10 years of my adult life. Um, so combining my interest in distilling, which had pers consisted, you know, uh, per persisted with me throughout my academic journey, I learned how to distill from a friend. Was doing it in my kitchen in Arizona, which is one of two states where it's legal at the state level. Mm -hmm. um, and then that plus sort of my my family, um, the way I was just brought up and socialized to kind of think about small business and entrepreneurship. And then combining all that with uh, location, you know, my family had uh, been living in the Joshua Tree area for like 20 plus years or had second homes there and um, doing the whole economic analysis, making the business plan, uh, running the numbers. It just kind of all came together and I thought it was worth giving a go. So, wow. Yeah. So would you say that, I mean, where did, did it start with a passion for distilling or you recognize the business opportunity? Which was it for you? I'd say the latter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think distilling is really cool. Don't get me wrong. I, I always have. That's why I learned how to do it as a hobby. But I think a lot of stuff is really cool. You know, yeah. I think building computers is really cool. I think, uh, you know, welding and soldering copper is really cool. Woodworking is really cool. Skiing is really cool. Like, you know, and, and, and distilling also. But the reason that I'm doing this uh, right now, 100 hours a week, is because I'm trying to make uh, you know a living, and 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 it's a job that I enjoy and doesn't make me want to jump out a window. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you know, it's a career. You have to have a career. You have to have a job uh, in this in our society. And this one, um, I thought I'd like. Yeah. So three years into it, tell me a little bit about that journey, man. What, what's if you could kind of put your finger on what the biggest challenge has been for you, what, what would that be? Uh, financing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we're we have always been continue to be way undercapitalized. And um, that's my fault. I'm the person who, who who's in charge of that and makes those plans. But, um, you know, early on getting advice from some other folks in the industry as best I could. Um, but it's difficult because every situation is different. Yeah. You talk to somebody who started a distillery in, in, in Arizona or Texas or, you know, New York, you know, it's a different regulations, different state, three tier, not three tier, all the rest. Mm -hmm. And then every year things change, you know, you have pandemics and consumer trends changing and distributors change what they're interested in. And so even if you do your best to try and get really good advice and, and, and figure out where you're heading and what your plan is, um, especially in an industry this small and this nascent, it's it's going to be really difficult to get a roadmap. And so I way underestimated how much capital we needed to really to get to a point where we'd have sustainable cash flow. Mm. And that catch 22 
uh, is always tough. So let's say you start with a million dollars. If you keep a really, really tight belt, this is how my dad would do it. Okay. Keep a really, really tight belt. You, you know, you save scotch tape strips to reuse. Uh, you don't hire almost any employees. You do every, you're doing the tasting room. You're doing paying taxes. You're doing social media. You're doing manufacturing. You're doing everything. Um, and uh, that million dollars, maybe it'll last you six, seven years doing mm -hmm. it like that. But are you going to grow? Mm -hmm. Or is anyone actually going to learn about your company? How many you're going to have over those seven years? Maybe you serve 100,000 unique customers, let's say. The other way of doing it is you could spend that million dollars really fast. So, um, so you could hire employees, marketing, really push. And then maybe you have 100,000 unique customers in one year. Yeah. And um, so on a terms of a long term growth trajectory, uh, it probably makes more sense to do the latter. But of course, if you're doing the latter model, you're going to need more money more quickly. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of catch 22 between spending to grow or keeping a tight belt um, is been difficult to manage. And, um, you know, the hope is that if you spend a million dollars in a year, which which we have, we haven't spent that much in a year. But if you did, hypothetically. Um, and you had 100,000 unique customers that then you'd get to a point of cash flow sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you just did the slow and steady way, maybe you never get to a point of cash flow sustainability. Um, so there's some optimization problem there that some mathematicians who aren't me could probably figure out. But there's a sweet spot between, you know, spending and, and, and saving and to, to spending to grow and trying to get there. And so that's really been what I've been trying to map out and figure out. And, and what I've realized is, yeah, we really should have started this company with probably two or three times as much capital yeah. as we did. Because, because if you want to get to a place where you are cash flow sustainable, um, especially in California, three tier states, the distributor has to take a cut. There's no getting around that. Um, you need wholesale to, in, to some extent, like just a tasting room. We, we're in a potentially best case scenario for, for good tasting room profits, mm -hmm. being in a huge tourist destination with very little competition. Um, but you just, you're never gonna make it without the wholesale component because your fixed costs are, in, are not that of a gift shop, right? Yeah. They're not that of just a regular tourist activity, they're that of a manufacturing plant. And um, growing the wholesale becomes extremely difficult without money that you could really use for marketing, for reps, for promos, for sponsorships. And so just sort of navigating that whole process and getting the financing has definitely been the biggest challenge. Okay, wow. Um, that's a lot, man. And it's really interesting to me that you, you approach this business from a vantage point that's I think different than a lot of people that I talk to where they come into it as like, it's a, it's a passion. Oh, it's cool. It's, it's a passion. It's something that, um, you know, they were distilling at home, maybe illegally and thought, you know what, I want to do this for fun. And you saw the business opportunity in it. So I've got two important questions that I want to ask you. The first one is the future. I want to talk about the future. And then I want to talk about the past, meaning that, Hey, if you could jump back in the time machine, go back three years, what's that piece of advice that you would give to yourself? And, Future ring, what do you see from your from your business here five years in the future? Like, where are you going? What are you focused on? What do you think? Where do you think the industry is going? Because I'd love to tap into that that brain. That's just I know you got a ton <laughs> of things in there. You could you could help the community with. Yeah, I mean, so uh, close to home, I think that agave spirits in California are going to be the next California wine. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, probably it should have been brandy. That's the OG California, you know, native local spirit. Uh, we took all our wine that we were making, all those grapes, turned it into brandy. I love brandy. I'm a huge fan of brandy um, and a lot of other uh, What are your favorite songs spirits. of verse? Uh Yeah, there's some <laughs> good songs out there, too. <laughs> Um, but you know, for, I, for, for, for our brandy, the singer songs, I'm sorry, man, I, I couldn't uh, resist it. Okay. Uh, I totally understood. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, I grew up uh, Armenian and Italian. They drink a lot of cognac yeah. and, you know, Armenian, Armenian brandy and that kind of stuff. But, um, brandy, like some other spirits that I love, consumers don't really want they don't know about, they don't want, there's no got milk campaign for it yeah. yet. Not um, yet, right. So uh, with all due respect to the OG California spirit, uh, which we just discussed in, in, at length, um, I really think agave spirits are gonna be what actually takes that, takes that crown because people do want it. 
Okay. Um, and so we're starting to develop. We have some fermentations going as we talk um, at our distillery from plants that grew in Marietta in mm -hmm. California. Um, we're also building some some brands that will be able to scale faster. So we have some sources in Mexico that are going to be bringing in some really unique um, agave agave spirits. So not Blue Weber, small production that we're bringing in in totes and will proof and and and. and you know, apply our process and brand and bottle. And um, so I think that, you know, the future, uh, one aspect of the future is going to be this huge boom in agave spirits. Okay. Um, and you think that's regional or do you think that that's going to be a national trend? I think that it'll be a national trend. I think that it'll start in, in California and the Southwest. I think that it'll become a defining economic export of California, but I think it'll be, you know, national that people will be drinking it, thinking about it, knowing what it is. Okay. All right. So next question is going to be, we're going to jump in the past, but before we go, before we jump into the past, let's take a quick little break for some fun rapid yeah, fire Tell questions. me more about some bamboo spirits. Yeah, I might. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now this is, we're going to do some, some rapid fire questions for you. Just a couple. And you just tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. Let's see. Most surprising spirit you ever tasted. Oh, I really love weird spirits, so it'd be hard to pick just one. Really? You know? Well, give me give me a couple then. I know the one that comes to mind right now is Sinar. Sinar. Yeah, I'm not sure how to pronounce the artichoke vermouth. Uh, a lot of people have tried that artichoke vermouth. Yeah, uh, uh, it's not too hard to find. There's um, uh, oh, what do they call it in Chicago? That gross thing they make you drink if you visit there. Uh, it starts with like an M, I think. <laughs> You know what now, I'm talking about? I don't know, but I think you're offending our Chicago. I love Chicago. My wife's from our Madison. Chicago members we have a lot of friends in Chicago, <laughs> but uh, but they have a hard on for. They know it's gross. They yeah. like make you drink it when you visit. Uh, like it's a you know it's, it's like one kinda, of those things. It's like a local moonshine. Yeah, you know it's really, I haven't had really it, so whatever it is, let me know. Malort. That's what it's called, Malort. Yeah. Malort. It's like really wide cuts, like headsy, gross, you yeah. know, neutral spirit. Um, but. But I mean, honestly, whenever I'm at a bar, one of my favorite things to do at a fancy bar, I was just doing it last night at the Cosmopolitan across the street, um, is like kind of stare at all the weird cordials and mm -hmm. and weird spirits and just and just try them. Um, so one, you actually, anything cool last night? Yeah. So there's uh, this spirit, Ch Ch Charu. It was like a French spelling. It was a clear bottle, kind of stout, clearish or whitish label. It looked like chartreuse, but mm -hmm. it, there was no T. And it's an aloe spirit. Okay. It tasted like aloe vera like juice. Like, you know, if you go to like a oh, hippie, yeah. like Whole Foods or whatever, yeah. you can get the aloe vera juice or you just like grab a stick of aloe vera out of your plant and you lick it. Um, <laughs> tasted like that, but uh, but as a like weak spirit. I, I didn't look at the ABV, but it tasted like maybe 30%. Did you like it? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a huge fan of like aloe juice at Whole Foods yeah. either. So I don't know that I uh, was like, oh my God, it's the best thing ever. But I think that it tasted good like i don't think it was gross okay like, all yeah. right so we're we're kind of here on the on the aloe <laughs> okay um next question if you could distill with any historical figure who would it be that's oh a that's, weird a, one, right? that's a weird and tough question um maybe uh theodore roosevelt Ah. I think that'd be fun. i hang out with that guy. You know what? I, I bet yeah. he would be a fun guy. Yeah. Is that the reason why? Because you think he'd be cool to like... I just, I want to get in his head, you know? He did a lot of cool shit. Uh, uh, he's, I think, one of the more impressive American presidents. And a uh, big out, outdoorsman. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know if he knew how to distill, but it seems like something I'm he'd sure be he did, into. I'm sure he did, because that guy, like, knew everything. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, I think he would be the most interesting drinking but drinking Yeah, buddy. I think yeah. it'd be a good time. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's a good answer. Okay. So, back to the business. All right. This is the show for the people, for the community. There's someone out there that is you right now. <laughs> this is that, that is you three years ago. Sure. All right. What's that piece of advice you give them and would have given yourself three years ago? Um, one is make sure you have access to a lot of a lot of money. Mm. It doesn't mean you need it all at once. But take a hard look at your networks, your friends, your family, who, who you could potentially pitch um, and think about what is the most that you think you could raise, not counting on a VC firm or, or a bank, you know, in your life. And and be really honest if that number is enough. 
because you don't want to get started down the road, have taken some of your friends and family money, have lost two years of your life or a year of life, and then not be able to finish what you started. So be really realistic about that, no matter how excited you are, be realistic that you can actually finish what you started because what's worse than not starting is, 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 is failing after a year or two. I know a lot of the life coaches and stuff will say, you know, just try, it's okay to fail. Well, yeah, sure. Easy for you to say if you're a trust fund, you know, kid or whatever. But when you have all your friends and family from your whole life, everyone that you ever met, everyone that you're close to writing you checks yeah. and it's all their money on the line, it's not just your failure. That's right. <laughs> And, um, you know, and that, that shit's real. That's their, that's their, you know, retirement. That's their ability to pay their mortgage. Uh, and obviously no one should be investing in a startup with money that they need to pay rent the next month. But at the end of the day, um, you know, that, that's their money and it's important. So, so, so be really sure that you can make it all the way. And I would also say on that note, whatever your budget is, a lot of people give you advice, like make it 120% of that or 130% of that. I'd say double it. Yeah. <laughs> Double it. Um, well, well, yeah. well, let's get specific, Paul. It's because, it, it, you know, when, when you say raise a lot of money, that's subjective. A lot of money to me may not be a lot of money to you. Sure. Let's 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 try. Let's put some numbers to that. I think it, it really depends on your business model. Mm -hmm. So um, in California, um, you know, and every state's different, as, as you're aware. So I'll speak about California with a type 74 license. It's a craft, craft distilling license. There's a few different sort of ways you can go. One is uh, a fully grain to glass manufacturing plant where you're going to focus really on the fermentation, on the sourcing, on making the projects, products, selling to wholesalers. You don't even have to have a tasting room if you, if you don't want to or do tours if you don't want to. The other end of the spectrum is you're going to have a restaurant and a bar and an event space. And you're going to also distill some spirits, whether they're from fermentation or, or you're sourcing them. And in that in that uh, model, it's more of a service type business. And then, of course, you could kind of slide the scale in between. So depending on exactly how you're setting up your business is going to make a huge difference in the yeah. amount of money you need. And then, of course, which should be obvious to anybody where you're located, if you're going to be in uh, Santa Monica, you're going to need more money for rent or to buy the building, you know, than, than elsewhere. Um, but in general, I would say that if you're going to be getting into wholesale as part of your business strategy, so that means you probably don't have a restaurant and a bar. Um, you're going to need you're going to want to have a few hundred thousand dollars to spend over a few years on sales and marketing incentives, commission bonuses for reps, uh, merch, giveaways, swag, uh, support for bars and um, and liquor stores um, and that kind of thing. So if you're going to spend a hundred thousand or so on equipment on your still and pallet racks and that kind of stuff, you're going to spend another hundred thousand or so on graphic design, probably. Yeah. Um, you'll probably easily spend a hundred thousand over your first three years on legal fees if you're taking investment um, and and trademarks and all that kind of thing. Uh, and then I'd say at least two or three hundred thousand you want to allocate to to marketing. Um, and so that's all like not even talking about any burn, any runway you'll have of actually operating every month, because more likely than not, you're going to be operating at a loss every yeah. month for the first few years. So you also need to account for that burn. So, so I'd say if, if you're going to, if you're going to do it all, you're going to do tours, tastings, maybe a restaurant to bars, uh, wholesale, direct to consumer, you're going to want. I'd say three, four million, mm -hmm. uh, at least, uh, maybe, maybe a little more to start with. Um, and that's just to give yourself the, the, the runway, the time to get to the point where you're actually self-sustaining. Yeah. Um, another piece of advice I'd give people in, in my position, which I could have really used was coming from academia, academia has a certain culture that I was familiar with because you're in school from the time you're born, right? I just kind of stayed in school more or less my whole life. The only job I had before, this one that wasn't academic was I was a salesperson. Uh, I used to just go door to door and sell solar energy credits, and I'd go. Uh, I sold Cutco knives. I was a regional sales champion. Cutco. Um, Cutco. Yeah. Nice. Good knives. Still have them. Still use them. But um, but in academia, there's a certain culture. It's very collegiate, of course, and it's professional. A little bit more casual. Uh, as I mentioned, my family all in the small business world, and I always had this perception that the business world was a little bit more professional. Um, less uh, informal, mm -hmm. more formal, more professional, more transactional. Emotions largely are out of it. You know, it's, it's business, mm -hmm. as, as people like to say. Yeah. 
And so I assume that if I came in with a good business plan and a strong business proposal and business reasons for folks to work with me, that that was sufficient. Yeah. Uh, I also assumed very naively that us all being legitimate, established businessmen, none of us are Mexican cartels. Uh, you know, prohibition was a long time ago that 99 percent, 98 percent of businesses I work with follow the law, at least the big, broad strokes yeah. of the law. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Really? Um, What'd you find out? Um, uh, trying to work with bars, liquor stores, sales rep, no one follows the law. Not mm. even remotely close. They, you, get, well, you will get laughed at in your face if you try and tell somebody that, well, I can't do that because that's you know, not three-tier compliant or that's tied, a tied house problem or that's what it, They don't give uh, a crap at all. I mean, yeah. and they will demand that to work with them you have to do things that are um, not strictly legal, not what you expected, uh, put you in a more vulnerable position. But ultimately, if you're a new supplier and you're a tiny, 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 tiny supplier, you know, you got all the Bacardi's, Diageo, Constellation, you know, and then on the supplier side, and then you have um, Southern and Young's and everything on the distributor side, you are completely insignificant. You have almost no leverage in the situation. So if a liquor store says, you know, I'll put your case I'll put a, your bottle on the shelf, but only if you buy out all the bottles that are there right now. Uh, it's completely unprofessional. It's super not business-like in yeah. my mind. It's thuggish and, and something I'd experienced in a developing country happens every single day. It wow. is considered normal. That is a very normal interaction to have that, oh, well, yeah, buy out that spot and I'll put your bottles there. Do you think that's unique to the California market? It's different than other? I, I, I can't say. I wouldn't know, but I doubt it. I yeah. doubt it. Um, and I mean, that's just one example. There's there's myriad. Oh, you want to be on our menu and our bar? Well, then pay for pay for this other stuff. Yeah. Because, you know, they're smart enough that they're not going to just take the money directly. But it's like, oh, well, our phone bill costs 300 bucks a month. Maybe you maybe you pay our phone bill. Yeah. And then we'll put your spirit. on. I mean, wow. it's 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 gangster shit. Wow. It's um, and I didn't expect that. So so that's part of it. Um, and then it's also it's it's emotional. Um, I, I didn't expect with how much I was going to be dealing with people's emotions, buyers' emotions, bar managers, especially bartenders are an interesting breed of people. Mm -hmm. And um, I love them. And, and thank God for them, because I'm not a very great uh, mixologist. <laughs> and I love going to a great bar and chatting with a wonderful bartender, getting a good drink. But I think even most bartenders would agree, you know, there's certain personality, certain kind of person that's usually drawn to that draw, job. And it's not necessarily boardroom, corporate, all business sure. uh, personality. And so you have to do more uh, interpersonal work um, than I expected. Okay, Paul. So I want to know what cool things you're doing at your distilleries. We start to wrap this up. Yeah. Oh, one of the things I'm proudest of that I think is also really cool is our partnership with the Joshua National Park Association. So I mentioned in academia, I was an environmental scientist. Um, you know, I'm a big environmentalist. I care deeply about preserving our, our natural resources, our open spaces. And I've been an avid backpacker, hiker, uh, you know, rafter, outdoor recreation enthusiast since I was 15. Nice. And um, so starting this company in Joshua Tree, it was really important for me to obviously take advantage of the name, the, the cultural cachet that Joshua Tree has. Um, that was an essential part of the business plan. But it was important for me in doing that to not um, exploit the people, the place um, that we were, but rather yeah. rather take advantage of that cultural cachet, of that value to benefit everyone um, in the area. Uh, so our community, the park itself, our business, our neighbors, our colleagues. Etc. Um, and so I started very early on, before we even had a product on the market, uh, reaching out to different nonprofits and organizations um, in that area to see if we could work together. Um, and ultimately, uh, you know, created this partnership, Josh Tree National Park Association. We have their logo on the back of our whiskey, our Lost Source whiskey bottle. It's on the back of our giant rock gin. One percent of the sales, uh, all our sales of those two products go to the JTMPA. Um, the JTMPA is the uh, primary uh, nonprofit partner of the National Park Service. So because the Josh Tree National Park is a federal entity, they have some restrictions and rules about taking donations and that kind of thing. So the JTMPA does that part. So they 
they manage the gift shops and, and, and educational programming and all that in the park. And so every quarter we write them a check. Um, and that's been a wonderful, wonderful relationship. They're wonderful people. And I'm just so proud uh, and, and, and pleased that we were able to, to build that relationship and it's been working so well. So that's, I think that's one of the coolest things we do. We're 1% for the planet members. So 1% of all, all our sales, whether it's a hoodie or a t-shirt or whatever, go to various environmental um, organizations. Um, more cr concretely, I think what you're probably looking for with your question, I think that our um, our agave spirit is really cool. So our, our local California agave spirit, like I mentioned with plants from Marietta, it um, it's not quite on the market yet, but we're hopeful that by uh, by holiday season around you know the end of this year, it will be. We've done a few fermentation tests. We've done a few distilling tests and um, you know, we're just fine tuning it. But um, but this is really going to be plant to glass. This is this is plants growing in a in a residential home uh, that were planted almost 10 years ago, uh, kind of between San Diego and, and Joshua Tree. We're pulling them out of the ground, we're cleaning them, we're cooking them, we're juicing them, pulping them, fermenting them, distilling them, you know, proofing them, filtering them, bottling, the whole, the whole process. And it has been a lot of work, a lot of learning, um, but I think it's gonna be a really, really, really cool product that when it comes so out. That is so cool, that is so cool. Um, well, hey, first, Paul, I want to thank you for, for being part of this. Um, let our audience know, let our members know how they can reach out to you, how they can support you, um, how where they can purchase your spirits. Sure. We're at a Total Wine about a few miles from here in Vegas, uh, which is exciting. Um, you can also find a map of all our retailers on our on our website. Um, if you're in California, you could uh, you can give us a call and uh, or, or and we could mail you a bottle, or you could just go to Reserve Bar, Wooden Cork, a bunch of different online retailers to buy our stuff. Um, we'd love having visitors at our distillery. We're open seven days a week, 11:30 a.m. to 7 p.m. I keep hours like we're a supermarket. We are always open during the Hurricane Hillary. Open every single day. Um, I you know we are there. So if you're around and you want to come in and you want to get a tour or a tasting, just walk on in and, and, and we will help you and show you how we do everything we do and, and give you some, some great samples. And um, you know, our website is uh, joshuatreedistillingco.com and we're on Google Yelp and all that good stuff. Awesome. And we'll have all of their information also in the show notes. So guys, you can make sure and, 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 and follow Joshua Tree, make sure you get out there and support them. And again, Paul, this has been this has been awesome. Thanks for the transparency. Thank you for being a part of this wonderful community at ADI and what you bring to to help what you brought today to help our members. All right, guys, we'll see you in our next episode and we'll see you at our next conference. I want to make sure if you did not get out to to our 20th anniversary conference here in Las Vegas. Don't worry. We've got another one coming up. We've got other events coming up as well that are going to be out there to help the community to get out there and be educated. We've got some webinars. We've got a large slate of opportunities for members of ADI to be educated, inspired, and to spark that innovation. And I look forward to seeing you all there. See you next time. As we conclude another episode of Voices of Distilling, we want to extend our deepest gratitude to you our cherished listeners. Your support is the lifeblood of our show, and we are endlessly thankful for each and every one of you. If you've enjoyed our conversation today, please take a moment to rate and review our podcast. It truly helps others discover these spirited stories. And if you wish to further support our mission, consider becoming a member of the American Distilling Institute. As a member, you'll dive deeper into the world of distilling, gain access to exclusive content, be a part of our dynamic annual conference and immerse yourself in a community where knowledge and passion converge. Visit our website, distilling.com, for more details on how you can benefit from membership and contribute to the vibrant tapestry of distilling. Until our glasses clink again, remember, every drop has a story, every voice a passion. Raise your glass and cheers to the heart of distilling. Distilling.